since this is the last talk, we of course need to thank our organizers who uh, put this together. So Ben and Vic and Greg and Christine and uh, of course Pasha. So we should all thank them for. I'll also reiterate what's been said, said already. It's just it's fantastic seeing all these people in you know, combinatorics again after, after such a break. And also all the new people, a little too many new people to learn in one meeting. But, um, and I, it, it, it's just amazing the number of powering figures in combinatorics who came here to, get, you know, to both present talks and show up. And we're gonna end with a talk by one of them uh, on Catalan combinatorics by, by Nathan Lewin. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Is it on? Okay, great. Uh, so it's uh, great to be back in uh, Minnesota. I spent five uh, very long, very cold years uh, um, doing grad school here. I was reminded uh, yesterday exactly how much I, I missed this place um, uh, when we had that unexpected hailstorm. Um, yeah, it's great to be here at, uh, at OPAC, uh, which I believe is pronounced oh, hawk, um, <laughs> with the subtitle uh, Negativity on Positivity. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, it's really quite an honor uh, to, to be able to speak, be asked to speak here, uh, being neither the most distinguished Nathan nor the most distinguished Williams in algebraic combinatorics. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to, that's right. I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, I'd like to thank them for uh, moving me to the, uh, the last slot. Um, I'd like to thank them, uh, but the, uh, actually those, on you, those of you on Zoom can't see this, but the hall is completely empty uh, because uh, everyone has left, uh, including the organizers. Um, but uh, seriously, this has been uh, an amazing uh, conference. It's been, uh, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers. I mean, we did it uh, once, but let's do it again. The organizers and uh, all of the, the supporting staff that have uh, really made this such a great uh, in-person conference to come, to come back to. So thanks so much. Okay, yeah, so that ends the uh, stand-up portion of the talk. Um, Okay, so this is uh, joint work with uh, Pavel Galosh and Thomas Lam, uh, Mintam uh, Trin. It owes a debt of gratitude to, um, to my collaborators, uh, uh, Drew Armstrong, uh, Hugh Thomas, and Christian Stum. Um, and so uh, I'll take you back 10 years ago, roughly. Uh, there was this, uh, this AIM workshop on rational uh, Catalan combinatorics. Uh, it was put on by Drew Armstrong, uh, Stephen Griffith, who actually went to the same um, college that I did uh, in Minnesota. So I actually spent nine years in, in Minnesota. Um, and, uh, and Vic Reiner, and of course, uh, Monica Vazirani. Uh, and if you uh, want to see about what happened um, at this conference, then you can go take a look um, at this really, really good write-up uh, 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 for a rational Catalan combinatorics. You can see it in the bottom there. I have, I have some references here and there. Uh, and it's an outline from the AIM workshop. Really good write-up. Uh, I wrote it up. Um, <laughs> that was uh, 10 years ago. There were a bunch of open problems um, in it. Uh, so, um, so this is the start. This collaboration actually started um, uh, this year in, in January. So if, if I had given this talk um, in 2020, uh, everything would be open. Uh, but but we've made some progress. Uh, so so this year uh, I was reading uh, this lovely paper uh, by Pablo Galashin and Thomas Lamb: Positroids, Knots, and QT Catalan Numbers. You can see the abstract there. Uh, we relate the mixed Hodge structure on the cohomology of open posit. Okay. So um, three things became immediately clear. Uh, the first was that I couldn't understand anything uh, beyond the first two pages uh, of, the, of the paper. Um, the second thing uh, was that the first two pages were really, really well written, so well written that I could actually do calculations uh, with what was written in them. Um, uh, and the third thing was that uh, from a Coxeter theoretic standpoint, they had absolutely the wrong object. Um, so, so I could do calculations though. Uh, and so here what you can see is, um, but I, I guess I should use the mouse probably. Um, but uh, so, so that's, that's the paper. And then you can see this email. This is the email, the first email to start this project that I sent to, uh, to Pasha uh, on uh, January 21st of this year. Um, and it just, uh, so the title is Parking Analog of Galosh and Lamb, question mark. And it says, uh, hi, Pavel. And then there's some sage code, uh, best, Nathan. Um, and uh, this is actually a conjecture uh, in the sage code. So if you can read sage code, uh, there's some sort of conjecture. Um, and, uh, and we proved that conjecture relatively quickly. So we used some technology from their paper, like the first two pages of their paper, uh, this R polynomial of the, um, well, some affine heck algebra traces. We used, uh, it happens that there's some particular element in there, which turns out to be a translation. So we use this uh, uh, trace formula to opt them. And then it turns out uh, it, it, that becomes a sum over constant partitions. And uh, it uh, is a specialization of a certain um, uh, identity of ha Jim Hagland in, in QT um, uh, over Tesla matrices. And it turns out to be a specialization of that identity. Um, and I'm not 
talking about that today. Um, but uh, it's uh, we I continued experiments. We continued experimenting uh, into March, and, and that led to um, what I'm going to talk about here. And uh, and I just want to say that we had been looking for um, these kinds of results uh, since that AIM conference uh, ten years ago. And when I say we, um, it's not just the royal we. Uh, there are maybe you know four other people who um, uh, cared about it. Maybe uh, so, so so you know it's we. I guess yeah. It's Catalan common works. Okay. So um, good. So ten years ago. Uh, so I guess I should talk about um, Catalan numbers for you. Um, so you know all of this. Uh, let me point you to some references. Uh, so Igor Pak uh, has written the appendix to uh, Richard Stanley's um, a book on Catalan numbers. That's uh, the history of Catalan numbers, and he maintains a website. And uh, well, you should go read it. Um, uh, incidentally, he credits Riordan for the name Catalan numbers. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more. Um, and uh, in particular, we have this uh, the following theorem, which is that basically every uh, combinatorial object uh, is, is, is a Catalan object. Um, that's good. Uh, so the point of this talk, though, is um, I mean, actually reflection groups seemed a little bit underrepresented. I mean, we went really far with David Spire, but I, I'm, I don't want to do finite stuff. Um, but uh, so 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 the Catalan numbers. What I want to do is I, I want to sort of um, you can see I've written them as one over two n plus one uh, times two n plus one choose n, and I'd like to there are sort of two n's in there. I'd like to treat them differently. One of them is going to be uh, in blue, um, and that's going to be uh, corresponding to the parameter. So this n plus one is somehow this, a parameter. And one of them is in red. Um, and, and that's somehow corresponding uh, to a type. And these things are going to get uh, generalized um, uh, in two sort of different directions. Does that make sort of sense? Yeah. So the n's are actually different, even though they look the same. They're different colors. Uh, and so really, to, to make you appreciate this, uh, I need to talk about uh, reflection groups, okay? And so what's going to happen is this is the standard thing, right? The is there a type B analog, which is now by now, um, you know, a joke. It's become a joke. It's become a, a FibSac T-shirt. It's um, but uh, the idea would be that you interpret a combinatorial object uh, in, in terms of the symmetric group, and then you start working your way up the red axis, the red type axis. So you go to uh, vial groups, which are reflection groups over uh, the rationals, then to the reals, and then maybe to the complex. Um, and so I need to make you appreciate uh, reflection groups, I guess, to, to think like uh, someone who, who appreciates reflection groups, at least uh, for, this, for this talk. Um, so you guys like type A, probably most of you are type A people. Um, and, uh, and so I'm not gonna put like the definition of the symmetric group, but I'll put like some philosophy and things that maybe like you may be a little bit less familiar with. Uh, so like type A objects are all of these things, okay? So sort of the philosophy is that the symmetric group is actually supposed to be like a, a Lie group over a finite field with one element. Um, and uh, okay, that's kind of cool. So in particular, you've got like this Lie group, you've got a braid group associated to it, you've got, um, you've got a heck algebra, you've got an affine symmetric group, all of these things. And these have come up. So Spire talked about the affine symmetric group and he was doing massively infinite coxeter groups, but he did, he did very, very precisely define the uh, affine symmetric group. And, uh, and, and Mellet's talk, I think the heck algebra uh, came up. And of course, Gorski was talking about braid varieties and, and Juliana Tsaimoko, uh, there was, there was um, maybe some Lie groups going on. So this is the, this is the type A stuff that you love. Um, and the thing is that uh, it all kind of works for, for vial groups, okay? Now, uh, you know, don't, don't pin me down on the adjectives that I've put there on the, on the Lie group. Uh, you have to talk to someone else. But uh, so you've got some Lie group and then you've got a vial group and you've still got a braid group and you've got a heck algebra and you've got an affine vial group, okay? And these are reflection groups uh, defined over the rational numbers. We're working our way up the uh, type axis, the red type axis. So here's the classification. You just have a list of them. Uh, I've added in very faint gray uh, the, where, where the affine node would go. So there's some, some way to make these infinite, but controllably infinite. Um, and that's just a list. That's a classification of the finite um, vial groups, crystallographic reflection groups. Um, so as we work our way up, we come to uh, Coxeter groups. And uh, okay, so they have a certain presentation, uh, but they're real reflection groups. That's the point. And, um, and so they come with a set of simple reflections. There's some real geometry. Uh, so you're cutting up uh, real space into, into chambers. And uh, they still have a, a braid group. I guess I should have complexified, whatever. Um, they still have a heck algebra. But now you've lost um, the affine vial group um, because they're not crystallographic. So there's no way to sort of add an extra node and, um, and, and sort of stabilize a lattice. 
uh, you've also lost the Lie group. So now you can sort of pretend uh, if you write down some combinatorial formula, you can pretend that you were um, uh, that there's some Lie group maybe sitting around, but there's not one. But you could write down formulas if it existed. It would have to have these properties. Okay, so far so good. Oh yeah, so there's a class for the finite ones. Um, there's a classification, uh, and and there you go. I mean, in general, I guess you just write down a graph. Uh, okay, there's some isomorphism issues, but that's why I said Coxeter system. Um, <clears throat> but so here's the. Um, Here's the list, and you can see that a lot of them are the same as before. Uh, but you get some other, some new ones: this H3, this H4, and, and maybe some um, some dihedrals. Um, G2 was dihedral, but yeah. Okay, um, and then you go. Uh, so that was over the reals, and now we go over the uh, the complex numbers, and um, and now you sort of lose a lot more, right? So so you no longer have this the the real geometry. You no longer have simple reflections because these are come there there there's some subgroup uh, of of the general linear group uh, over the complex numbers but they're generated by complex reflections and so um well you've got a braid group that's fine but now yeah there's no simple reflections and so when you're trying to define a heck algebra it becomes more difficult but you can maybe you can get away with it you people people do try to do it uh, and they're very successful at it but it's still like it doesn't come for free there's no affine vial group and and the Lie group is this mythical object called the spets where you can write down all sorts of properties that this thing uh, would have to have if it existed um Right. The, okay. So, um, I, 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 as far as I know, these things are uh, somewhat mythical. Uh, but you can maybe write down some some character theory. Uh, but I don't know very much. Uh, and so you have a, a list of the finite irreducible complex reflection groups, and basically you've got one infinite family. There are some conditions on that M, D, and N, and then you've got uh, these thirty-four. Um, exceptionals like E8 is the biggest one there, G37. And you can even try to write down diagrams. And so you come up with these diagrams. Uh, probably one of them is called like the rabbit and stuff. So you can look up chasing the rabbit. Um, okay. So, uh, so you've lost a lot by going to the complex reflection groups, but that's fine. Um, what do they all have in common though? What they share in common is they have really, really, really great uh, invariant theories. So the whole point here is that uh, I can associate these beautiful numbers, these uh, these degrees um, to 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 uh, to these reflection groups. So, what was that? Okay. Uh, so the point is that uh, I have them acting on a polynomial ring, and if I look at the ring of invariance, then it's again a polynomial ring, and the uh, the degree of uh, the generators of this polynomial ring are these degrees, these v sub i's, and there are more general things of this, there are fake degrees and so on. But anyway, so you you know this for the symmetric group. When it acts, um, when it acts, uh, you get invariant polynomials, uh, the, and you have lots of different bases. You have the power sum of the elementaries, the homogeneous, the shares, um, the monomials, the forgottens, but always the degrees um, are the same. So you have this numerology. These these degrees are magical things. They're they're magical. They'll show up everywhere. Um, and so so now, hopefully, you're starting to think uh, beyond type A. I mean, I know a lot of you. Um, do think beyond type A, but those of you who didn't, uh, the point is you need to embrace uh, uh, looking beyond type A. And so now I need to tell you about the gold standard in, in sort of uh, reflection group uh, combinatorics, which is uniformity. So um, that is to say, uh, oh, I guess that should be a Q, but um, you wanna be uh, uniform over the, the vials, uh, uh, over the, uh, the, the, the coxeters or the, or, the, or, the, or the complex. You'd like to make uniform definitions. You make, like to make uniform proofs. Um, and that, and what I mean by uniform is that they don't appeal to the classification. So it's not like I, I write down, um, uh, you know, I just have this list. I just showed you the three classifications. I have a list, and I could just like check my thing on each of them. No, I want to, I want to not appeal to that. So, for example, here, here's a prototypical, prototypical example. So the order of the group is uh, the product of these degrees, um, and you could just check this uh, in any of the in any of the cases. You just uh, figure out what the invariants are, and you figure out their degrees, and then you product them together, and you check that that's the order of the group. Um, but there's, there are other ways to do it. So for example, I told you that if you look at the invariant ring, um, then it's generated, uh, then it's, it's, it's another uh, polynomial ring. And so therefore it's Hilbert series is given by this. Uh, it's a polynomial ring over these, these FIs and the FIs had these degrees. So in degrees, it's, 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 uh, it's given by this, this, uh, this product formula. Um, and so that, that's sort of equivalent to saying that it was a polynomial um, algebra again. And then uh, the other way to compute it is of course to take, uh, to take some sort of projection operator, some sort of averaging operator, and then trace, uh, and then take a, take a trace over that. And that would lead you to this, this formula right here. And then, uh, so this is, this is sort of uniformly done. And then I just multiply by one minus T to the N. And on the left-hand side, I'd get a product of one over, and then these QD numbers. Uh, 
And then, uh, and then on the, on the right-hand side, if I sort of expand this out and I think about what's happening, I have the identity that has a whole lot of eigenvalues, one, all of them. And then, um, and then everyone else has at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, one non, uh, one eigenvalue. And so I have this factor of one minus T sitting on sort of everybody else. And now I just let T go to one and I get that one over W is the product of uh, the degrees, or sorry, the product of one over the degrees. And that's equivalent to what I wanted. So that's like a uniform proof. I didn't have to check any, uh, um, uh, any diagrams. The gold standard. Great. Um, so uh, now that we have these magical numbers, I've convinced you of the gold standard and so on. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, Catalan numbers now uh, for reflection groups. Um, so, so here's here's just the definition of the numbers. So I've got this. Uh, uh, let, let's let, maybe we'll stick to, to finite Cox group groups, but it's fine if you want to go to, to, to complex reflection groups. And uh, I'll define this Catalan number, and it's a product of these magical numbers. So H plus one, H is just a, um, at least in the real case, it will just be the the um, uh, the degree uh, the, the 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 highest degree, the largest degree. And then I have these magic numbers E i and D i, and you can see that I've I've still uh, I've still kept things in red and blue. So the H plus one is somehow going to be my parameter that I want to be changing, and uh, the E i and the D i these are these are sort of linked to the group itself. Um, and so, for example, the uh, the regular Catalan numbers can be expressed in this way using the degrees and so on for the for the Catalan. And uh, now something interesting happens, which is uh, before when we were talking Catalan numbers, you know, Stanley has you know hundreds of interpretations. Uh, and you know, just about every Comfort object is Catalan, but now we have this amazing dichotomy, which is that there are really only two uh, Coxeter Catalan families um, when you're working at the when you're looking at it from the reflection group perspective. Okay, now I say that like that, that's very modern, uh, and that's due to very hard work of people like Nathan Reading um, or uh, amazing you know bijections of Cellini and Poppy or you know she stuff. Um, but uh, so on the one side you have non-crossing objects. Uh, and on the other side, you have non-nesting objects. And these are really, really quite different things. And let me sort of explain. Um, so for example, the non-nesting objects, um, I've given some examples of things that are sort of maybe anti-chains in the, in the root poset or their dominant chi regions, or maybe they're co-roots in some dilation of the fundamental alcove. Um, they're, they're defined only for, uh, for vial groups. Um, it's also very easy to uh, twiddle that parameter, which I haven't really told you about yet. And they also have a uniform enumeration. So, so they've got these three properties. On the other side, the non-crossing guys over here on the left, um, well, um, they all satisfy something like a, a Cambrian recurrence, which we can't find on the non-nesting side. They're defined at a much higher level of generality of reflection group. Like you can, a lot of them you can define for like well-generated complex reflection groups, but, um, but you know, certainly for, for Coxeter, all Coxeter groups, the, the, they, don't, they don't care. Uh, they're dependent on this extra thing, this, this Coxeter element. And uh, it's actually very hard, very hard to change um, the parameter. So you can get a couple special cases and I'll be talking about that. Um, okay, so for me, there's like, if you're talking like non-crossing partitions and clusters and sortable elements, they're all sort of the same thing, um, uh, but that's due to hard work and, and people like Nathan Reed. Um, okay, two families, yeah, yeah. So let me tell you about one. And so I'm supposed to tell you about the non-crossing family and I'm gonna have to do it. I'm gonna introduce you, I'm gonna do it by introducing non-crossing partitions, but that's just cause there'd be like a riot if I did the object that I actually want to use, uh, because they're not all the same to you, probably. And so I'll, so when you think non-crossing, you think non-crossing partition. So I'll have to start out with a non-crossing partition, and then I'll work my way to the actual object that I want. Uh, but it's fine. Um, so here's, here, uh, here's a history of non-crossing partitions. And I've omitted the history before everything sort of converged into one on the non-crossing side. I mean, there's, there's a sort of parallel histories for you know, clusters or triangulations and all that. I'm not touching it. I'll just give you the non-crossing partitions because it'd be too long. Uh, so there's, there, there it is. So you've got Creveras and you've got Montenegro is sort of a type B version. And then uh, Reiner's uh, uh, amazing paper uh, where he does it for classical reflection groups. Um, and that's sort of where it stood for a bit because the exceptionals, they're just too, too sort of difficult to, to work out uh, like combinatorially it seems. And then, uh, and then there was this paper by Berman, Coe and Lee where they had this sort of dual approach to braid groups solving this, uh, the, the, the word problem in a, in a dual way. Um, and, uh, and that sort of opened the floodgates. And then um, now the history becomes a little bit weird, but um, you know, Basis and Picatin and Brady and Watt uh, sort of all converged on this, uh, the, 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 the definition that I'm gonna show you, um, let's say. Um, so so non-crossing partitions, we all know what they are. There's a picture. And what, what maybe you're not aware of, but maybe probably you are, is that I could think of these as cycles uh, of an element in the in the in the symmetric group? Okay, that's that's really the the kicker. Uh, so you know, 
I'm thinking of like this thing is like one, four, two, three, or whatever. I didn't label them, but it's fine. One, two, three, four. This is like the full cycle, one, two, three, four. That's like a cycle notation. Um, and so how do you make that sort of uniform? Well, uh, you define reflections. Um, you define a Cox element, just take the product of the simple reflections in any order. So here I'm, I'm restricting myself to real just because interest of time. Um, and so for example, in the symmetric group, you just have a long cycle and you have transpositions, okay? Uh, and then and you don't need that other fact, but it's beautiful. Uh, so the Cox element is like a magical element that knows everything. Um, uh, again, it's very mystical. These degrees are mystical and the, the Cox element is also very mystical. Um, so then you just take uh, the, the sort of the Cayley graph generated by all the reflections and you take an interval in it. You take uh, from the identity to, to, the, to the Cox element. These are the non-crossing partitions. And that gets you exactly um, the usual non-crossing partition lattice if you thought of non-crossing non partitions as cycles. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, I guess that's not what I want to use though. Um, I, I want to use, uh, so, so that's, that's, that's the non-crossing object uh, sort of that, that you know, or that, you know, but I want to use these subwords. So, um, so this is stuff, um, you know, this is, uh, so this is of course, uh, this Knudsen and Miller subword complex, uh, and then by work of uh, reading and Ceballos Slave and Stump, and then Pilot and Stump, um, uh, uh, we sort of uh, understood how, how it's a non-crossing object, I guess. Uh, but so we're looking at uh, subwords. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna have to draw some paths for you. So hopefully you can follow. I'm gonna be using the mouse. I don't have like um, a nice sort of laser thing. So hopefully you can follow. So I'm, 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 I have a particular word, which in this case is just uh, STSTS, okay? And I'm looking for subwords in there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna like, when I read letters, I can either skip the letter or I can follow the edge with the letter on it, okay? And um, what I wanna do is I wanna start down here at the identity and I wanna end at the, at the top, okay? Um, and what I want to do is I want to, uh, uh oh, did we applaud too early for, uh, for Trevor? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I don't have, um, so, okay. So uh, we're looking at this word S T S T S right here. And, uh, and so I can either stay and I want to stay exactly two times uh, and I want to walk from uh, down here uh, to up here. And so for example, what I could do is I could stay, stay and then go STS like that, okay? Uh, or I could, uh, so that's the, that's the first one here. It's like a stay, a stay, and then I go STS. Or I could stay, uh, I could uh, walk S, then stay twice. I hope you're seeing this. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's, it's like probably the most technical part. I'm sorry. And then I go TS. And so then I go T S and then I end up at W naught. And so, uh, and so let's just do this one. So I could stay, then I could go T S T and then stay. And that would be this last one, okay? And this models the, uh, the exchange graph of the corresponding uh, cluster algebra. Um, okay, and in particular, they're in bijection with non-crossing partitions. Um, and the bijection is as follows. What you do is you replace the stays, okay? With sort of the corresponding colored inversions. So let me explain. Um, let, let's do this one right here. So I stay, stay, then STS. And that's corresponding to over here. And somehow I'm seeing the reflections one, two, and two, three. So what's happening is I'm staying, but if I were to have used the S, then I would have seen the one, two right here. Okay, that's labeled by one, two. That's the reflection corresponding to, um, to the edge, um, right? And then, uh, and then I would, I, but I stayed. And then I would have used the T. So I see two, three, and then I stay. And then I go STS. And that's sort of this one right here. Or if I were to use this one, let's do this one right here. Then, uh, so that's a stay. So I would see one, two, right? Cause I'm not using the S, but I would have seen one, two. Then I go T, S, T. And now what's interesting is that I'm supposed to try and use the S, but I'm actually staying. And so I see two, three. And that's where the, the, the color comes in. The color comes in because I've already passed two, three once. I've already passed an edge labeled two, three, right? And so uh, I want to sort of record how many times I've passed such an edge in the past. And that's where the colors come from. All right, how comprehensible is that? Oh, uh, the colors are dots. The colors are, are dots, yes. I, I didn't have, um, yeah, the colors are dots because, yeah, I don't, right. Yeah, what's the first color? Um, yeah, no, that's a good point, yeah. I don't know why we call them colors. Um, and they're numbers also, you could, um, yeah. So, okay, uh, colors are dots uh, for the purposes of this talk, except when the colors are colors. Um, yes.
Yes. So, so the yeah, you, you need to count. Yeah, you, you right. You need you need to count the number of times you've seen that reflection in the past on your path, okay. and that's where the color is coming from. If you're if you're familiar with uh, the subword complex, this would be like the root configuration, and you'd maybe just see pluses and minuses. But in the in, in the future, I'm going to want many many colors. So yeah, dots. Yeah. Um, okay. Other other questions. That that was okay. Okay. Oh, great. All right. Um, okay. So um, then, then the theorem here is that actually the number of whatever the the if you want to think the non-crossing partitions, but I want to think of these subwords, then it's counted by this Catalan number that we previously defined. Um, and uh, this Catalan number is, uh, is is this product of where there's this this parameter in blue, and there's this type stuff there. And I guess this was I mean okay. So Vic will correct me, but I think this was conjectured in his paper he has the formula appearing in in his his paper on the non-crossing partitions for the for the classical types i don't know if that formula appeared uh, before um and then uh, and then i guess the proof i'm going to attribute to to basis where he checked it case by case the proof was not uniform so there are combinatorial models uh and then computer checks and there you have uh, a, a picture of the startup screen a, a, a st startup screen of, of gap three with chevy uh, which uh, you should all have like running on your computers at all times. Um, it is magnificent software. Um, okay, so let me just point out that, um, for example, what that means is that like the number of finite type uh, of clusters in a, in a finite type cluster algebra, um, that was not uniformly known uh, to be counted by uh, the W Catalan number. Okay, so for example, because for me, all of those things were living on the non-crossing side of things. Okay. This is a true statement. Um, now, here's some recent development. Um, so Jean-Michel found a uniform proof, um, but only for vial groups, and not of the statement that I just had, but of a slightly related statement. Uh, it's a related problem where you're just trying to count the number of factorizations of a Coxer element into, into reflections. Um, and uh, so there's this amazing formula of uh, Guillaume Chapuis and Christian Stump, and this apparently uh, inspired him to then do some very fancy um, representation theory, that's the third bit there. Uh, the second bit is sort of how everyone does it, but the third bit is, is really where the fanciness came in and he was able to find a uniform proof uh, using fanciness. Okay, everyone happy with this? Yes. Well, uh, so, 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 Chapri, so, so basically the, um, oh, sorry, uh, you're right, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so, so the the, the question the question was um, uh, the one, two, and three are black boxes. Yeah, or, or, or all that background. Uh, right. Okay. So, or all, is all the background uniformly proven? Okay. So the point here is that you can um, do a lowbrow proof of the Chapuis formula um, if you're if you have a lot of um, like uh, hard work uh, ethic. Uh, so uh, basically, this Frobenius character theoretic method. Um, that will just let you do it. If you work hard enough and know enough character theory, um, then you can just type by type check the statement. Um, but it's, you know, it's painful. Um, yeah. But so the, the, the innovation, what's that? It does that would not be uniform because you're using, you're using facts about like the, 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 the character table of the symmetric group. And then you're using facts about the character table of whatever other group. Uh, the, the key point is that the Delinea Lustig theory, the fanciness is letting Jean-Michel write, write a four page paper that does it uniformly. Okay, because he gets access to the character theory by higher means uh, through, through the Lie group. That's why it's only working for, for vial groups. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, so this sort of gives you hope that maybe things could be done uniformly. Um, okay, so this was, this was problem one. Notice there's no open there. Um, uh, uniformly prove that uh, the number of non-crossing partitions is actually given by this, this product formula. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I, I've, I've numbered, I've numbered uh, the parts here. So this, I guess we're going to talk about uh, why the foos. Um, okay. So here is, again, I'm just restricting to uh, real. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the history of, again, just non-crossing partitions. So I'm not looking at, you know, M-type cluster algebras, but there's lots of, lots of, lots of very, very nice work. Um, you know, Buon, Wright, and Thomas, uh, lot, lots of people did sort of M versions of, of that, but it's fine. So uh, again, we start with Kreveros, then, um, then Edelman considered this chain enumeration and non-crossing partitions. It's a beautiful short paper. 
Um, and then, and then uh, Drew Armstrong's thesis uh, was this generalized non-crossing partitions and combinatorics of Cox groups. It's a beautifully written um, uh, monograph, uh, which I spent many happy hours reading here in Minnesota. Um, actually, if you check, uh, yeah, check, check the check the address there. Uh, he he was he uh, it says current address. Uh, he, he was a postdoc at Minnesota. Um, yeah, I guess I should have mentioned that that Igor was also at Minnesota. Um, yeah. A lot of Minnesota. Okay, uh, good. So that's the history that I wanted to touch on. And so what is the main construction? The construction is you look in the non-crossing partition lattice and you look at M multi-chains and then something amazing happens, which is that the number of these things, uh, of these multi-chains is just um, MH plus one, uh, the, the parameter change. So it changed from H plus one to MH plus one. Okay, this parameter changed. This is the cox rufus catalan number. And uh, you could give it combinatorial interpretations, uh, M divisible non-crossing partitions. And in uh, my book with, uh, with Christian Stum and Hugh Thomas, uh, we did a lot of uh, the stuff. I mean, um, but but the, the object that I want, not the non-crossing partitions, the object that I want uh, is this is this thing. So uh, instead of looking at subwords in, in, in before it was like in and just you know S T S uh, T S. Now I'm like making a longer word where it's C W naught to the M of C whatever. Uh, and they start at the identity. Uh, they end at now W naught to the M, which is either the identity or W naught, just depending on if M is even or odd. Um, because it's an involution, and then it has n stays. Okay, and the point is that there's this the same bijection with the non-crossing uh, part, the, the multi-chains. Um, you can just basically read it off. It's some. Uh, it's probably like Drew Armstrong's delta sequences or something. Um, but again, you can see now that the number of colors has increased. Okay, so because m this example m is two, uh, the number of colors is is you can have two colors. And so, for example, if I were to go, uh, so let's let's follow this word. If I go s t s t s t then uh, what I've seen is I've seen every reflection twice. So now when I do my two stays at the end, I would see one, two with a color two and two, three with a color two. Okay. Good. Okay, great. Uh, so you can draw this and, um, okay, great. Um, and then you can do um, a corresponding, uh, you can tweak the parameter here by changing support and you'd get this MH minus one. And this is this uh, Fus Dogalon number. Uh, yes, really, cat and dog. Um, and then, and then you get stuck. Basically, those are the two cases um, uh, that you can do. You can do MH plus one. You can do MH minus one, and that's and that's it. Um, and yet, and yet, uh, this this product formula, where, where as long as P is um, co prime to H, it's always an integer. And so, uh, around 2012, Drew Armstrong um, started asking uh, these sorts of questions. But like, what non-crossing object is counted by uh, this product formula? Um, you know, is it, I mean, what is a, I mean, you have multi-chains, but how do you take like a fractional multi-chain or maybe there's some support condition additionally to um, uh, just like in the Fus Dogalon case, or how do you do some subwords? And I mean, we worked, we, we, we exhausted um, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of things. We, we use a computer, Christian Stump, uh, you know, we, we exhausted a lot of different uh, options. We couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't figure it out. Um, couldn't figure it out. I will again recommend that you go look at my, uh, uh, the, the the problem uh, session thing from uh, from AIM. It was amazing how much I was pretending to understand back then. Um, okay, uh, all right. So um, great. So I'm I'm not going to say very much about this next part, um, but you can look at the pictures. So remember that there are non-crossing partitions and non-nesting partitions. And I just want to point out that the non-nesting partitions, um, whatever. So they're 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 anti-chains or they're they're order ideals in the root poset. Doesn't really matter what that is. Um, uh, but the point is that. Um, you can get them as, as, as like co-roots inside of some dilation of the fundamental alcove in, in the affine bile group. And the point is that, that you can take other dilations very, very easily. Okay, so the parameter just easily scales, but it's only defined for bile groups because bile groups are the one that you can define an affine bile group. Okay, so you can easily tweak that parameter, uh, but you have a lot of trouble uh, defining it for like, you know, H3. Well, yeah, so, and you can hack. Uh, so I think that's basically what I want to say. And then the other weird thing is that you can prove uniformly or, you know, up to, up to almost nothing, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the number of these things, uh, is given by, by that formula. It's very easy to count these. You don't need the common for models or anything. Cause you can do, I don't know, something as simple as like Earhart theory if you wanted. Um, so yeah. Okay. So anyway, that was, that was the only thing really that I wanted. I wanted to stress that there were really these, these differences between the non-crossing and the, and the non-nesting side of things. But even to the point of where they're defined and what's easy to generalize about them. Yeah, so you can check out, I think it's section seven of, of Heyman's conjectures um, uh, in the quotient ring by diagonal harmonics. Um, 
Okay. Oh, and the point is that I get to ask open questions. Uh, so, so that, that that's sort of the point of that section that I just you know didn't tell you about. Uh, but the point is that uh, you could ask like, well, what's the analog of of a non-nesting partition for a complex reflection group? Um, uh, and then and then this one, you know, find a uniform bijection between uh, uh, non-crossing uh, partitions and non-nesting partitions where they're commonly defined. So like maybe uh, so just for you know p is equal to h plus one. Uh, and since my thesis, there's been a candidate using toggles. Uh, which I, uh, in type A has been proven by uh, a group at Lassim. Uh, so there's the group, Florian Egner, uh, Monjaman Juken, um, uh, Gabriel Frieden, Alessandro Irachi, and, uh, and Hugh. Um, and so they, they've, they've proven in type A, but I mean, it's not a uniform proof. The, the statement is completely uniform, but I, I'm not going to show you that the, the, the conjecture because it's a, it's a disaster, but you can look it up uh, somewhere. Um, Okay, uh, and of course there was work uh, by Armstrong, Stump, and Thomas, I should mention, there in the references at the bottom, uh, and they have uh, some sort of construction, but I don't wanna say anything about that. Um, okay, so, uh, so now uh, uh, for the new stuff, uh, got, I've got 20 minutes? Easily, great, okay. Oh, all right. Uh, so, um, so I wanna tell you uh, that, that we've sort of closed um, some, some of this. Uh, so uh, in particular, um, so we found uh, rational non-crossing partitions, I guess, or something that deserves to be called that. Uh, and that works over Coxeter, finite Coxeter groups. And we've also uniformly proven um, that, that the number uh, of uh, non-crossing partitions um, is, is given by the formula. And that's, that's uniform over uh, the rational numbers. Um, okay, so let me try to explain a little bit um, with maybe miss, you know, skipping some pieces that we don't wanna, don't wanna see. Um, okay, so um, if you see adjectives that I'm missing on this uh, on this Lie group, then um, you know keep it to yourself and tell me afterwards. Sorry. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, the point is that if you have some Borel subgroups, then um, you can talk about their relative position. Okay, and essentially, relative position is, is somehow like telling you about uh, the weak order. So if I'm starting at B plus down here, uh, I can sort of look upwards at all of these. You know, it's the flag right. I'm looking at all of these Borels. And sort of really far away, they're going to be, if I'm working over a finite field, they're going to be like Q cubed of them uh, sitting over there. And it's just going to be like the length um, for, that's the number of, of Borels that are sitting like right here on ST uh, that are in relative position ST to, to my V plus, they're going to be Q squared of them and so on. So you sort of can see weak order sitting inside of, um, of the flag variety. And, um, and then you can build a variety out of this. So what you're going to do is uh, you're going to look at the following. Okay, and so you should you should start to see like subword stuff coming here, and we'll see exactly how it comes up. But the point is that I'm going to fix the B plus to be a first uh, sort of Borel, and then I'm going to um, insist that the second one be in S1 uh, relative position, and then S2 relative position, where S1 S2 up to Sn is a is a word for C, and I'm going to do that p times, where I insist that the last guy uh, is in W naught relative position to B minus. So I sort of came back around to the identity, although. With respect to B minus. Okay. Uh, so this is this is some sort of variety. It's defined for any P. Uh, it's dependent on this choice of Cox element. It's defined for a vial group. Um, um, and uh, and the, the theorem that we have with Pavel and Thomas and Mintem uh, is that over a finite field uh, with um, Q elements, then uh, then the number of points inside of here uh, is given by this Q analog of the um, uh, of the W Catalan number, okay? So um, let me do the same sort of sketch that I did for Jean-Michel's proof uh, because I don't understand the proof. Uh, so first uh, there's, um, you can relate this uh, via some sort of uh, uh, Hecke algebra character theoretic method. So you take some trace basically. Um, so the number of points inside of this variety can be computed as a trace in the Hecke algebra. Um, that, that, that part's okay. Uh, and so at that point, I sat down with character tables and uh, was able to, to work out a bunch of this and I have a little calculation that we'll probably skip. Um, um, and, then, um, and then the point is that you don't wanna do that because uh, that requires um, like a lot of hard work. And so instead what you should do is um, you should use the highbrow stuff. You should use uh, this Delinea Lustig theory. Um, and so Mintam Trin ha had done that in his thesis. Um, and furthermore, he had related it to uh, some sort of uh, graded characters of rational Turetnik algebras. And Gordon and Griffith had previously um, uh, established formulas for those. And so if you trace through all of this uh, with, the, with the highbrow stuff, then what you obtain 
is you obtain a, a uniform proof for, um, uh, for, for vial groups of, this, uh, of the point count of this variety. Um, so what I can show you is uh, this, uh, this lowbrow calculation, but I don't know that we wanna see it. Um, well, there's some facts that you need to know. The point is that the character of um, some particular braid uh, when, I, when I project it down into the Hecke algebra is related to the character of um, uh, the corresponding Coxer element. Uh, so, so this particular uh, TC to the minus P, I project, I project it. Um, so I can relate the character to the Coxer element and the Coxer element, it turns out its character um, vanishes uh, like super, super often. If I look at the, uh, if I look at the conjugacy class of, of, the, of the Coxer elements, there's gonna be a lot of zeros. In fact, they're only gonna be, um, uh, H characters where it doesn't vanish. This is apparently an observation of, of McDonald. Uh, so, so there's this H many Europe's where, where the character doesn't vanish and I can relate the character of some particular power in the second algebra to that. And so I can write down some, some sum and then maybe I can use um, like the Okay. Yeah. Brief interlude. Okay. Is it is it good? I mean, I feel like it's better when I'm like this, and then, well, yeah, but I mean, I'm like hunched over. The, okay. Okay. I mean, stiff, stiffer color, maybe. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So the, the point here is that uh, there are these very, these very useful formulas. I'm just going to hold it. Uh, these very useful formulas uh, for these sure elements uh, in, in, in this Gek Fefner uh, book. And so, so yeah. And then also um, this gap three with Chevy is just unbelievable as a piece of software. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm running like four instances of it. Uh, at all times on my computer. Okay, and so here's the theorem again. Um, and and this, is, this is the question that you really wanna know. It's like, show me the combinatorics. So you did some stuff and there were you know finite fields and points and whatever, uh, but where's the combinatorics here? W yeah, question. Yeah, uh, 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 different P, yeah, different P, yeah. What? Oh, the, the question was, is Q a power of P? And the answer is no. Uh, okay, so um, so yeah, the question that you, at the end, you know, you, you want the answer to this. You want to, you want me to you want me to show you the combinatorics, and so I can. Um, and the way this combinatorics goes is it goes through this uh, Diodar decomposition. So this 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 particular variety has a decomposition that goes back to Diodar. A lot of people have considered it. Um, uh, and so the idea is what you do is you look at the relative position. Um, so I'm going to sort of uh, decompose this space into a bunch of pieces that are all going to look like uh, F star to some power times uh, F, uh, FQ itself. Um, and uh, when I'm looking at the relative position of B minus to each of these Borels, so you can see that here. And if I, so each of them is going to be, uh, the, the relative position will be encoded by this U0, U1, uh, UN, okay, all the way up. And then the point is that if I read those off, um, those particular pieces off, what I get is I get a subword of just uh, C to the P that starts and end at, ends at the identity. And uh, it can stay, but the sort of Diodar condition uh, is that I have to go down when possible. And if you remember when we were assigning colors to the stays, that's sort of the same thing as saying that there are no odd colors on the stays. Okay, these are called like distinguished subwords. Um, Okay, so, uh, so for example, uh, I'll show you all of the elements um, where uh, for, for this particular case where P is equal to four, that's, that's sort of, um, and I'm gonna look at just the ones that have two stays, which turns out to be uh, the, the minimal number of stays. And it actually sits inside of this example that we did before. So if I just gray out some of them, 
these guys get left. These are the ones that have no odd colors. So you can see, for example, that uh, right here, two, three had uh, had a, had a single dot. Sorry, dots. Uh, and that and that, that's an, that's like a, it was it was an odd color. So I could I should have gone down. Let me sort of do 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 the example with the mouse. So if I was looking at this particular word, which is um, this subword, so I would go up first to S. And then uh, I'd, I'd, I'd read the T, but I don't actually use it, right? Because I'm right here and it's, it's a skip. So I see the one three. Uh, and then uh, what you can see is that I, I would read an S again. And because the condition is I must go down, uh, when I can go down, I would have to go down. And that's a sort of equivalent to, uh, to there being an odd um, color there. And so this one does not get, um, is, not, is not one of my distinguished subwords. Okay. I start and end of the identity and I have no odd colors. I get this little picture here. And uh, right, so so now, what does this data decomposition tell us? Well, it gives us this decomposition into these into these subwords, and I have uh, this power of q minus one that's corresponding to the f star to some power, and it's q to some power. And in the, in this, the, all that's important is this this power, which is the number of stays. And so the point is that I have this equality. So the the, the entire variety decomposes like this, the point count, and it's equal to this thing as a point count. And so um, I have this q minus one to the n sitting out front. And I'm going to divide, and the point is that n is going to be the minimal number of skips that I can have. And just like in that uh, uniform proof for the for the size of um, uh, of, the, of the reflection group being a product of degrees, um, sort of a lot of stuff is going to go to zero as q goes to one. Um, and that's exactly what happens. So if I define n c to the p um, uh, like this, this these rational non cross partitions to just be these distinguished subwords with exactly n stays. Then um, I get this sum over over those things, these non-crossing, these rational non-crossing objects, and then a sum over, um, uh, over over things that have more stays. And the point is that as q goes to one, all of those things vanish, and so I'm just left with the uh, the fact that the number of these subwords uh, is is given by this this number, this this rational Catalan number. So I've actually got objects in my hands, um, and the only thing that I haven't done is convince you that those objects that I'm holding are actually non-crossing objects. Uh, and so I'm gonna do that. And so the point is that there's a very, very simple bijection that goes between, um, if you like in the Foos case, uh, this, these, these rational um, non-crossing things in the Foos case with uh, our old non-crossing partitions. And the bijection is basically just half the color, half, have the colors um, on the skips. So, you can sort of see how it goes. So here, like one, two, and two, three, they, they both had color two, but if I have it, then it would go to one, two, and two, three with color ones and so on. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's a non-crossing object. It's encoding non-crossing partitions, um, or at least non-crossing objects, if you admit that every non-crossing object is the same. Um, okay. Um, and so this problem that Drew Armstrong asked, you know, already back in uh, 2012, what non-crossing object is counted um, uh, by uh, this product formula? We have an answer. It's this. It's these, these sorts of subwords. Um, and I looked for this for a very long time. Um, okay, so here's an open problem. Uh, so find combinatorial models, right? So, so now we've got these objects. But uh, you actually should be able to draw like non-crossing partitions uh, that, that, uh, that, 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 that they're encoding. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't. I don't know how to do this. I, I've drawn some pictures. Um, they're it's not obviously, um, you know, non-crossing thing. I don't know. Uh, so in the rational case, right? In the, in, in the Foos case, it's very easy. Uh, but but in the rational case, it's some new beast. And so there should be there should be pictures. Um, there you go. Uh, uh, no comment. The question was, is that the same thing as a combinatorial interpretation? And uh, so then you could ask about extensions. Uh, like for example, what about parking structures? And here the reference would be uh, uh, Armstrong, Reiner, Rhodes, let's say, um, or just Rhodes, uh, these parking spaces, parking structures, and so on. And um, the answer is yes, uh, we can do those as well. Uh, and the trick is you just sort of twist uh, your initial uh, starting point for the Borel. Uh, and then the point is that if you sort of uh, union up all of those, then, uh, then the point count is exactly what you want. It's exactly the Q parking number. Um, and so you again, um, and you can again get the combinatorial objects in the same way that I described before. Uh, and they're gonna be the objects that had exactly N skips. It's the same, it's the same thing. Um, um, I have not, oh wait, oh uh, yeah. So, so um, the combinatorial objects um, in the Foos case, uh, I, I did I did an example and they appear to be exactly the same thing as the um, as the um, 
non-crossing parking functions from uh, for, from the from from the papers of, of Armstrong, uh, Reiner, and Rhodes, or just Rhodes. Um, I haven't proven it, uh, but I, I suspect it's not so hard. Um, okay, so um, let's end with some open problems then. Uh, so this is you know this is the theorem um, or a theorem. Uh, so we we solved some things. So. So we actually solved over um, the vial groups to uniformly prove this formula, which I'm, I'm super excited about. Uh, we solved over the, um, the Coxeter groups uh, uh, to find um, the rational non-crossing partitions, at least some objects uh, that are like this. Um, so in particular, what this means, let's just jump to four. What this means is that now sort of non-crossing objects and non-nesting objects exist at the same level of generality, because now I can tweak the P very, very freely on my non-crossing object and I sort of only get the full power of all the methods when they're defined over a vial group. And so now I've got two sets of things that are really defined in the same land. And so um, I'm not gonna say that I'm very hopeful that we'll get a bijection between the two, but I'm very hopeful um, that we'll get a bijection between the two. I am gonna say that actually. Um, okay, I, I, think, I think it's cool that they're now defined at the same level of generality. Um, so uh, I guess the open problem, uh, the third one there is to actually define what, what a non-nesting partition would be for, for a complex reflection group. So there's a notion of non-crossing non is just some interval, at least for well-generated. Um, here's the one that's to find non-crossing combinatorial models for these things. Um, and the really big one that I think we're gonna pursue going forward here is to follow uh, Pavel's uh, recipe for success, uh, uh, which is to compute mixed Hodge cohomology. Uh, I don't know how to do that, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll tell me. Uh, that, that, that's the direction to get the, um, the sort of QT uh, versions of these things. Um, and here's some open problems that I found while making these slides. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is sort of weird, but if you look, so there's no, there was no reason uh, before to consider this, but if you look at the sort of um, the thing sitting inside of these, these two Cambrian lattices, it's the structure that I drew before. Um, uh, if I restrict to just the, uh, the, the words that had even colors on the skips or the stays, sorry, um, then it appears that that's actually the non-crossing partition lattice. And uh, that's, that seems outrageous, but I did some calculations yesterday and it seems like, it, I mean, it, it's true in a bunch of different examples. So that's really cool. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in uh, what also happens as you, as, you, as you tweak this, if you look at higher uh, uh, 2M Cambrians, you can look at the even colored uh, reflection, uh, even colored uh, guys in there and there seemed to be something interesting going on. Um, uh, here are some bonus problems. Um, so, um, so the point was I did a, bun a bunch of experiments uh, when I was trying to uh, you know, get into this, this project. And, um, and so I just did a bunch, I computed a bunch of R polynomials. And here are some R polynomials that turned out to look interesting. Uh, presumably you could like, so for example, for, for the CN one, you could just uh, use the standard like trace techniques and just get it. Um, I haven't done this. Uh, for the affine ones, you have to be a little bit careful. If it, if it happens that this thing is a translation, okay, this one is. So um, in that case, you could use like Optam's formula, this trace formula to get something. Um, uh, but like, for example, um, for example, this bonus four, uh, whatever it means, this thing is not a pure translation. And so you can't apply his formula. So it doesn't work. And yet it's giving uh, interesting uh, numbers. It's giving some parking numbers anyway, so there's maybe a reason. Uh, and then there's another one. Oh, this is equivalent to some some work of, of Garcia and um, Hagland and, and uh, Armstrong and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, and so uh, so some problems, open problems, um, some successes, uh, and I guess that's uh, that's it. So uh, thank you. So the, the question, yeah, the, the question is, um, how bad are quaternionic reflection groups? Um, and the answer is, I don't know. Could you repeat? What is it? Oh, Schroeder. Um, uh, so the question is about Schroeder or uh, or like dissections, yeah. dissections. Um, Right. Uh, okay. So these are like faces, probably of the associohedron, and um, 
Yeah, so somehow this, this is maybe corresponding to looking at uh, words that have more uh, skips. And so it seems like there, there, ought to, there might be some combinatorics. Um, that said, um, yeah, I, the, the, the formulas, I mean, I looked at some of these words with uh, more skips and, and I, didn't, I didn't see uh, so many beautiful formulas, but. This week. So I can't hear you, Vic, but I think you're telling me to unmute. Yes, that's okay. right. So, um, so thanks for a great talk and congratulations to you and your co-authors on a really great result. I'm really impressed, but I wanted to ask, um, I, I feel like I should know this if I were quicker, maybe from watching your talk, but do the non-crossing partitions that you've, uh, that you've constructed, do they come with a natural partial order attached to them that would be like the non-crossing partition lattice or non-crossing partition yeah. order, or is that still missing? Yeah, okay, I, do I have to repeat that? Okay, uh, so it's an excellent question. Um, so, right, so, so the thing is, it's kind of like an analog of, of, of more like the, the cluster exchange graph thing, except, um, yeah, it seems like the edges are broken, like you can't always flip. And so it's, it's really not clear. Um, I, I don't know how to do that yet or ever. Um, uh, it, just like the obvious sort of thing where you might just say, oh, I'm gonna map to, um, you know, the product of the of the roots that come with like negative sign or something um, uh, and then sort of order those in, in absolute order. Uh, well, no, you, you, you'll fail with that. I mean, these, these, these things are, are, are quite a bit more bizarre. Um, so, so it's a great question and they, they don't, as far as I can tell yet, come with a, a really natural analog of the non-crossing partition lattice. Thank you. Okay, so the, so the question is uh, to clarify about a new uh, bijection between non-crossing and non-nesting. So there, there is no new bijection between non-crossing and non-nesting. There's a conjectural bijection from, uh, from my thesis that I didn't talk about. Uh, so that's this slide here. Um, and there is, so there's a candidate. And the point is that um, if, if I guess, so it's not recursive. So they have to use some sort of, so they have to go. They, they sort of have to go down. They don't really know when they have to go down to parabolic subgroups, which is which is not great. They um, it's also only for the bipartite Coxer elements. So there's and this thing would be for any Coxer element. And you know, you, I mean, you're you're at, at some point, right? It's the gold standard, right? I mean, this is their, their paper is you know, whatever. It's already the gold standard. Maybe I'm now asking for the platinum standard or something. I don't know. Yeah. You can always be super picky.